انما indeed not but كان it was قول المؤمنين the statement of the believers what is the reaction of the believers اذا دعوا الى الله ورسوله when they're called to Allah and his messenger ليحكم بينهم so that he may judge between them who may judge between them the messenger will judge between them according to the law of Allah so when the believers are invited what is their reaction their only qawl is ay yaqulu that they say samirna we have heard wa atarna and we obey allah says wa ulaika and it is those whom they are al muflihun the successful ones it is those people who will be successful who those who say samirna wa atarna now i've heard next step is that i have to obey and obedience comes immediately you know just like the women of the ansar aisha radhiyallahu anha praised them she said may allah have mercy on them the night these ayat were revealed when they heard about the hukum of hijab they didn't wait till the next day or the next week to go shop what did they do they took their bigger garments they cut a portion of that to use it as khima to use it as something to cover their beautification with whatever they had they used it if they needed they would borrow a hijab of their friend and that doesn't mean okay you have five you have 50 can i have one no what did that mean we'll both go together under one hijab we'll share it because that's all they had they shared it can you imagine they shared it if that is all they had but they did not want to be in a state of disobedience to allah and his messenger even for a moment this is who the believer and this is who muflih the successful one eventually this person will be successful why because yes right now they might be enduring some difficulty it's not easy to walk with a shared hijab right it's not easy to do that or it's not easy to wear something on your head that's not technically your hijab right it's not easy to walk in a bigger hijab anyway sometimes it's inconvenient or it's not easy to even put the hijab on and go in front of people it is difficult but allah says eventually they will be successful because how long is this life how long is it just a couple years right just a couple of years i mean think about it when it comes to summer time hmm? everybody wants to just take their clothes off but then what happens a couple months and then you have to layer up you have to cover up that shows to us that the enjoyment of this life is little so don't pursue that enjoyment rather invest this time in something that will bring you eternal enjoyment and pleasure so those who obey allah and his messenger samirna wa atarna allah says they will be successful eternally forever they will be happy and you know the word muflih falah who is falah a farmer what does a farmer do what does he do he works all the time right early morning his work begins there's no day that he can skip because one day he has to do the fertilizing the other day he has to do the tilling another day he has to do the weeding and the watering and this work just never ends until you have your final product isn't it so constant effort constant work and then eventually when you get your product you can enjoy it so this world this life is for work where is enjoyment where is it in the next life in jannah so those who work now who strive now who prove their love for allah and his messenger who prove that yes ya allah i want to be close to you and how do we prove that by obedience then yes such people will be brought close to allah in jannah in jannah they will be brought close to allah where allah will make them happy where they will see allah where they will talk to allah and allah will favor them with every blessing that they can ever imagine more than what they could ask for but this is for who those who strive those who prove by their obedience now these ayat it is said that there is a particular context to these verses and what is that context remember this is a madni surah right and when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did hijrah to medina for the first time ever people from different tribes 
were coming together under one leader. This was something unheard of in Arabia. This was something that was never done. Because the Muslims were from all different tribes, all different places, right? The biggest thing was that there were those among them who were freed slaves or who were still slaves. And they were also free people. They were men and there were women. They were people from Quraysh, from the highest, most noble lineage. There were people who were different. There were people who had come from Mecca. There were people who were from Medina, right? There were people who were previously Mushrik. There were people who were previously Jewish. There were people who were previously Christian. Salman al-Farisi, who was he? He was a Christian before. Abdullah bin Salam, who was he? A Jew before. And the rest of the Arabs, who were they previously? Mushrik, right? So, for the first time ever, people from different backgrounds were coming together. And what was the uniting factor? The one uniting thing? It was Iman. It was their Islam. And who was their leader? It was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, in Medina, what we see is that when the Muslims migrated there, there was a diverse community, right? There were people from every possible background. So many different, different types of people. Now, when there's so many different types of people, there had to be a new system also to resolve disputes, to resolve issues, right? So, now when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, he made, you can say, the constitution of Medina, all right? And what was that? That all the Muslims, all right, all the Muslims, they are together, all right? And if they have any matters of dispute, who will be their judge? Who will be their judge? The Prophet ﷺ. Not their tribal elders, but who? The Prophet ﷺ. Now this was for who? For the Muslims. At the same time, they were Yahud. Now for the Yahud, the Prophet ﷺ made a treaty with them also. For them, what was the understanding? That if you have any disputes, you resolve them yourself. Your own judges, your own elders, your own leaders. Because they were a different religious community. You understand? So for them, who was going to resolve disputes? Their own leaders. For the Muslims, who was going to resolve their disputes? The Prophet ﷺ. This was one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ initiated when he came to Medina. Now what happened, that there was a Muslim man who had, a person who claimed to be a Muslim, who had a dispute with a Jewish man. And he knew that if he went to the Prophet ﷺ, he would judge according to the Qur'an. And the Qur'an did not give him haqq. Meaning in the sense that man who claimed to be Muslim, he would be proven guilty. If he is guilty, then he has to suffer a punishment. So he had an idea. He said, you know what? Forget it. I'm not going to go to the Prophet ﷺ. Since I have an argument with the Jewish man, let's go to his leader. Because according to their law, I am going to get something. You understand? I am going to get something. So he said, you know what? Forget about the Muslim law. I'm going to go to the Jewish court. So this is what is being criticized over here. When they're called to Allah and His Messenger, they don't want to come. However, if they know that the ruling will be in their favor, then they want to come. And we see this unfortunately in many Muslims living in non-Muslim lands also. Huh? Or in a place where you know majority of the people are non-Muslim. So for example over here, when it comes to issues of divorce, for instance. Right? Now it's understood what's in the Islamic law. What is the woman's haqq? What is the man's haqq? But if we find out that if we go to the other court, right, we can get 50,000 more, we can get half the share of the house, even though we never paid a penny for it, we can get it, then we'll go rushing to it. Isn't it? But when it comes to giving divorce or taking the mahr, then what happens? Is there any sharia court in Mississauga? So I can demand my Haq, I can take it away. See, this is what is being criticized. This is the context of these verses. But it's not just limited to this incident. We can apply this in our daily lives also. We can see our shortcomings, our mistakes in the light of these verses. Then what is really our attitude to the command of Allah? To the law that Allah has revealed? Do we just take it when it's in our favor? If somebody does that, that means there is nifaq. Because a believer for him, all of Islam is beautiful. For him, the whole Qur'an is beautiful. And such people, Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ 
Because woman, whoever, يُطِعِ اللَّهَ He obeys Allah. وَرَسُولَهُ and his messenger. Whoever obeys Allah and his messenger. وَيَخْشَ اللَّهَ And he fears Allah. وَيَتَّقْهِ And is conscious of him. Has taqwa of Allah. فَأُولَٰئِكَ Then those whom they الْفَائِزُونَ The achievers. It is those who will achieve. Achieve what? Attain what? Success. They will attain success. How will they attain success? Achieve success by making it to Jannah. By being saved from hellfire. So, who is it that will achieve success? Who will attain success? Those who obey Allah and His Messenger. Secondly, secondly, يَخْشَ اللَّهَ Fears Allah. Thirdly, tell me the word. What is it? يَتَّقْهِ Say it. يَتَّقْهِ Good. From taqwa. He has taqwa of Allah. These three conditions. First of all, obedience to Allah and His Messenger. And obedience is how? With words? Is it with words? How is it? With actions. I have learned, samirna wa altarna. Now I will do. I heard, now I will do. I learned, now I will practice. Secondly, he fears Allah. No matter where he is, in Canada, in Pakistan, in Somalia, wherever in the world he is, America, New York, what is that, Times Square? Right? Doesn't matter where he is. Square one? Okay? Doesn't matter. School? University? Workplace? Doesn't matter. Yakhsha Allah. He fears Allah because Allah is watching me here. I'm still Allah's servant because I am Allah's servant. So I have to be Allah wherever I go. A wedding party? Whatever it is. Because sometimes we choose to obey Allah in certain places only. Then again, what does that show? That the fear of Allah is missing. Because if the fear of Allah is there, then it doesn't matter whether Sister Temi is there or not. It doesn't matter whether our friend from the Quran class is there or not. A group in charge is there or not. Because who's watching? Allah is watching. This is honesty, right? Honesty with oneself and honesty with Allah. This is the difference between iman and nifaq. The believer is honest with himself, he is honest with Allah. And a munafiq is dishonest with himself, he is dishonest with Allah. This is why he changes faces, his condition, his apparel as he goes from place to place. Why? Because he is dishonest. You know, there was a companion, Abu Lubaba radiallahu anhu. You know the incident of Banu Qurayla, a particular Jewish tribe that lived in Medina, and they betrayed the Muslims at the Battle of Khandaq. Alright? They turned against the Muslims at the Battle of Khandaq, and their plan was to go and attack the Muslims. While the Muslims are guarding the trench, go attack the women and the children. Wage war against the Muslims. So the mushrikeen are behind the trench, and now the Banu Qurayla turned against the Muslims, and their plan was to attack the Muslims from inside Medina. So, their plans failed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the Muslims. After the battle of Khandaq, the Prophet ﷺ arrived in his house and he put his armor down in order to take a shower. He was getting ready for a shower and Jibreel came. And he said, why did you put your armor down? We have not put our armor down. And the Prophet ﷺ said, what do you mean? He said, go there, go where? And Jibreel pointed towards Banu Qurayla. So the Prophet ﷺ could not rest at home. He just came from Khandaq. Mujikin had left, he comes home, and now he's told, go to Banu Qurayla. So he left immediately. Now when he got there, what happened? Banu Qurayla, the Muslims laid siege, because they locked themselves in their fortresses. Alright? And the demand was that surrender. Once you surrender, then we'll figure out what needs to be done. Now the Yahud started setting conditions. Well, if you just let us go, you know, we'll leave Medina. You let us go, we'll surrender. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, we're not bargaining on anything. You come out, and then we'll discuss what needs to be done. You surrender. So after many requests, they eventually said, send Abu Lubaba to us. Alright? So the Prophet ﷺ said, okay. He sent Abu Lubaba. Abu Lubaba went inside. And these people, what they did is, that all their women and their children, they gathered around Abu Lubaba, and they started wailing and crying and making a scene, basically. So Abu Lubaba, his heart kind of softened towards them. Alright? And what happened? They asked Abu Lubaba, what do you think? Should we surrender? And he said, yeah, but 
he went like this. That if you surrender, you're dead. Alright? You're dead. So Abu Lubaba did that. Immediately Abu Lubaba realized that he had betrayed the Prophet ﷺ. Because first of all, the Prophet ﷺ had not decided that he was going to do that. This is what the people thought would happen, but he had not decided that yet. And secondly, even if he had decided, Abu Lubaba should not have told the enemy about the Prophet ﷺ's plan. So what happened? Immediately Abu Lubaba realized that he had been dishonest. The Prophet ﷺ didn't see him. The Sahaba didn't see him. He was the only Muslim in there. He could have gone outside, pretended like nothing had happened. But what happened? He left immediately. He went straight to the masjid, tied himself up to one of the pillars and he said, only the Prophet ﷺ is going to untie me when Allah will forgive me. So the Prophet ﷺ said that had he come to me, I would have forgiven him and I would have asked Allah to forgive him. I would have prayed forgiveness for him. But since he didn't come to me, he went straight to the masjid. Now I can't do anything because now I have to wait for Allah's hukum. When Allah will forgive him, then I can go and release Abu Lubaba. So what happened? Abu Lubaba is locked up in the masjid. He's tied himself up. And he's in that condition for many days. Until eventually some ayat were revealed concerning his repentance being accepted. So his repentance was accepted. And the Prophet ﷺ was with Umm Salama in her house at that time. And Umm Salama, when she found out that, okay, Abu Lubaba's repentance has been accepted, she said, Ya Rasulullah, can I go and tell him? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, go ahead. So Umm Salama went to the masjid and she said, you know, be happy, be glad, Abu Lubaba. And he said, no, only when the Prophet ﷺ will untie me. So Umm Salama had to go back and she had to call the Prophet ﷺ and then the Prophet ﷺ had to come and he had to untie Abu Lubaba and then Abu Lubaba was satisfied. Then he was satisfied. What do we see here? His honesty with himself. I have made a mistake. I have done something I should not have done. It may seem minor, but it is big. It will seem very big on the day of judgment. That I betrayed the Messenger of Allah? I'm showing my loyalties to the enemy of Allah? This is not acceptable. And he, he was honest with himself. This is the way of the believer. What does the munafiq do? He lies. He comes up with excuses. He justifies the wrong that he has done. يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ In reality, they're only betraying themselves. Like for example, when it comes to hijab, right? We could come up with many excuses. The best excuse, the best card is the husband card. Right? The husband card. Oh, my husband doesn't like it. You know, I'm such an obedient wife, you know. My husband doesn't want me to wear the hijab. I am so obedient to him that I will disobey Allah to please my husband. I am so obedient to my husband. Really? Is that the case? Are we that obedient? If we were that obedient to our husbands, then first of all, we would be showing respect to our husbands, treating them as husbands and not as subjects, not as children. We would be seeking their permission before going out. We would be telling them when we are planning to do something. We would be taking their advice. We would be accepting their instructions, their orders, if we were truly obedient. But the fact is that we follow our own desires. We don't want to do something ourselves, and we put the entire blame on the poor husband. Or we put the blame on our parents. Or we put the blame on the society. Whereas in reality, it is us. It is always us. We can blame our husband. Oh, he doesn't get a fajr. My fajr gets delayed. Oh, my children. You know, it's all their fault. Blame whoever you want, but you know that you are guilty. You know yourself. We know ourselves. Who is truly at fault? Because when we want to do something, we don't need our husband's permission. Do we? He can tell us, I don't want you to do this. And we'll bring the tears. Or we'll start the argument. Or we'll, you know, do something. One thing or another. We'll come up with something. To make sure that we get it our way. And I'm sure you've experienced this. When it comes to dealing with parents also. When you want that pair of jeans. Right? That $60 pair of jeans. Or that $80 pair of jeans. How do you beg your mother or your father? 
Please, 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 please. I'll do this, I'll do this. Please buy, buy me those. I really want them. Mom, mom, all my friends have it. I still don't have that pair of jeans. I really want it. And if she says, oh, but they're not that loose. No, no, I promise I'll wear Nabaya on top. I promise. Right? I mean, we come up with so many things to get things our way. We beg, we plead. Even if we're told no, we do it anyway. Isn't it so? If we're told that no, not this month. I already got you new shoes. I can't buy you more clothes. Next month, we'll see. What are we thinking about? Can I get money from somewhere? Maybe I can sell something on Kijiji. Right? Maybe I can, you know, go and work somewhere and make some money. Maybe I can trade something. Maybe I can sell my iPod. I don't need it anymore. I'll sell it. I'll get money. And the next thing you know, you're wearing those jeans and your mom says, where'd you get that from? Where'd you get the money from? Oh, I sold my iPod. When we want to do something, we find a way. Where there's a will, there is a way. When the will is lacking, then what happens? We start the blame game. Excuses upon excuses. Who are we deceiving? Who are we deceiving? ourselves. Are we trying to deceive Allah? Does He not know our state? Does He not know the state of our hearts? The willingness or the unwillingness that is there? He knows. The way of the believers is what? They say سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيَخْشَ اللَّهِ He fears Allah. وَيَتَّقْهِ What's the difference between khashiyah of Allah and taqwa of Allah? What's the difference? What is khashiyah? Fear, that is because of knowledge. Knowledge of what? The greatness of the being that you fear. If we realize who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly is, if we have ma'rifah of Allah, if we know who He is, then we would never prefer the desire of our parents or our husbands or our children or the society over the command of Allah. The fact is that we do not know Allah. We claim that we love Him, but we don't really know Him. If we knew Him by His names, His attributes, if we knew about the knowledge of Allah, then we wouldn't be disobedient to Allah. We wouldn't dare disobey Allah. You know, the very fact that Allah sees us is frightening. The very fact that He hears our whispers, that is frightening. The very fact that He knows whatever we are doing, whatever we are thinking, whatever we are feeling, He knows our situation, that itself is frightening. But the fact that He is going to question us, He is going to call us to account, for what we have done, for what we thought, for what we decided, that is even more frightening. Just think about it. The one with absolute power, Maliki Yawmiddin, he knows what we are doing. And he will ask us, he will judge us. Isn't that enough to force us to obey Allah? So the one who has khashiyah of Allah, because this khashiyah will lead him to action. وَيَتَّقْهِ has taqwa of Allah. Taqwa is what? Taking wiqaya. It's basically guarding, safeguarding, protecting yourself, shielding yourself. From what? From the hellfire. From adab. Shielding yourself from the adab. The one who shields himself from Allah's adab. That is a person who will be successful. He will attain. He will achieve. And those who lack these qualities, what will they achieve? What will they achieve? Yes, one day somebody is happy, the way we're dressed. The next day they're criticizing the shoes that we're wearing because they're very old-fashioned. Huh? One Or we're constantly pursuing, running, running, chasing this dunya, and at the end, what have we attained? Only fatigue, exhaustion. Isn't it amazing? We dress up for people who we don't like. To impress people that we don't like, that we don't care about. Seriously, we do that. We spend so much money on clothes that we will wear for a few hours in pure discomfort, 
right? And stress that some kid is going to touch me with oily hands and there goes my precious chiffon or silk. It's going to get ruined, right? And who are we trying to impress? Who are we trying to impress? People. Which people? That we don't really care about. Because we're constantly looking down on the clothes that they're wearing. Or we're constantly, you know, looking down on the choices that they have made. What a waste. What are we gaining? What are we gaining? Nothing. Exhaustion. Fatigue. Failure. It's the opposite of fat is. Who is fat is? The one who gains. What's real gain? Jannah. Allah's pleasure. And that doesn't come easy. So, what have you learned? I just, my mind just went back to the Being Me conference when uh, Sheikh Taufik Chaudhry, he was saying that, you know, about blaming. He said that many times, you know, what Allah commands us to do, we constantly blame our situation or um, things that are going on around us. Like, for example, if we need to pray the heart, we say, oh, we're in class at that time. And, oh, you know, my husband doesn't let me do this or my parents don't let me do this. And he said, we need to change the paradigm shift where we should stop blaming others and get the action done. What we need to do, we need to get it done. Because if we constantly spend our time blaming others, we're not going to get anywhere. And also I was thinking at the same time, thinking of uh, what Hamza Tizorda was saying about when he was talking about how to give da'wah he, with non-Muslims, he said that, you know, if they bring up hijab or terrorism, you should take it back to Tawheed and Allah. And what was interesting was he also mentioned that even when you're giving da'wah to Muslims, right, about, you know, how to pray and for hijab and whatnot, you should also mention Allah. And people are asking, why Allah? Because Muslims know Allah. We learn about Him and are His characteristics and we pray to Him, so it shouldn't be a problem. He said, no, because if Muslims knew who Allah was, then you wouldn't be there giving them da'wah. So that really made me think that, you know, many times I'm not following many of the commandments of Allah. And that really shows that even I, to a certain degree, don't know much about Allah. And we should think about that. I mean, even when you have to do da'wah to yourself, because da'wah is basically calling, right? So when you have to call yourself to obey Allah and His Messenger, إِذَا دُرُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Then again, what is it that we need to remind ourselves of? The very fact that Allah has given this hukum, period. Allah has given this hukum and Allah is not unfair. He is the one who has put me in this situation. He knows what I am capable of. Right? And if He has ordered me to do something, it's going to be good. Right? So remind yourself that this is from Allah. Another approach is, okay, let's analyze the benefits of hijab. I don't have to do my hair every day. Okay. What else? What other benefits? You could say, oh well, it's going to protect my hair from extreme sunlight. Okay. A benefit. Another benefit. It's going to make me look more, it's going to make me look very spiritual. Okay. Another benefit. It's going to keep me warm in the winter. Okay. Another benefit. My neck won't get tanned. Right? Or my face won't get tanned. Right? Okay. No one's going to judge me. Okay. So you could come up with these lists of benefits, advantages, right? But more than anything, what is enough for us? Allah said. Khalas. He said. Because every other advantage, there's also a negative side to it, right? Isn't it? Like for example, you could argue that, well, if you don't do your hair every day, in the sense that you don't, style it every day, you could fall into that pattern, that bad habit of not caring about it at all. If you cover it when you go outside, then your hair is not going to get any sunlight. huh? Or when you have your hijab on, your hair is going to go flat. Right? It's going to lose its body. Right? Okay. There's always a negative side to it also. So the thing is that we're not wearing hijab for these benefits. For worldly benefits. What's the main benefit? I prove my love to Allah through this. I prove my sincerity to Allah. I prove that yes, Allah, I want to be close to you. I want to be near you. I want your pleasure. I want to make you happy. This is the goal. And it's easy to follow. But when we learn of a command, we start to analyze because we have that little tiny doubt in our hearts. So we start to analyze. We look at the benefits and the disadvantages and everything. And then by the end of that analysis, we tend not to do it. So just 
But from my own experience, when I started wearing the abaya, my biggest doubt was how am I going to do it and what are people going to think about it? And then I was like, you know what, let me just do it. And then I wore it on the first day of my school and then my friend, she was the most supportive of it, even though she doesn't wear hijab. And then basically all the doubts by the end of the week, they were gone. And I was most comfortable in wearing an abaya. Now if I go outside without it, I just feel uncomfortable. So the, basically the lesson is just do it and then think about it later. Yes, just do it. Why? Because Allah said so. And do it and Allah will create ease. Allah will make things easier. Assalamu I remember a little girl who came on American TV soon after September 11 it was. And the first question they usually ask is, uh, why you, aren't you feeling uncomfortable? Why are you covered? And she, her answer was so simple and sweet. I can never forget it. She said, I'm doing it to please my Lord. I'm doing it to please Allah. And that was the best answer, I would say. Yes. It, it is the answer. It is the reason why we should be doing anything. Assalamu alaikum. When you leave this country or different culture, different religion, different personality, and you work such a place, like where I work is a retail store, and you will meet everybody. And they wondering every day uh, why this person is doing this and that. And the other day, a lady I know had a long time, because I'm working there 10 years. And she comes, she said, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. She said, I'm from this country. She told me the country. I don't remember. She said, I'm immigrant here too, same as you. But I change everything, my life and the way I live. I say, listen, everybody is different but me. I don't change it for one reason, because where I live, back home Somalia or other, Allah is there always. And all I'm doing for this is my religion and Allah. And she almost cried. She said, I wish I did that. Like she said that. And I, I feel bad for her too, because she never realized it or she never think about it or she never had anybody to give her those things that she's supposed to do or not. So I was like telling myself, I'm so glad that I'm Muslim and I kept in my identity wherever I am. Alhamdulillah. And, you know, sometimes we try to analyze the commands of Allah, the laws that we learn in the Quran and Sunnah. And when we're analyzing them, we think about the time of the Prophet Wasallam, And we think that, oh, at that time, it was possible to do it. These days, it's not possible to do it because things have changed. The world has changed. Right? You know, the other day I was in this class and uh, the topic was the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The attribute of Allah's knowledge. And in that, the author had mentioned that, you know, that everything that's happening right now, it was known to Allah even before the creation was brought into existence. Because the first thing that Allah created was the pen. Even before Allah created the earth, Allah created the pen. And Allah told the pen to write. Write what? Everything that is going to happen. So the world that we're living in today, its details were written 50,000 years before the world was even created. So we're talking about even before dinosaurs. Okay? Even before that time. So 50,000 years before that, it was written that the world is going to be like this. Did Allah not know about it? Allah knew about it. And Allah revealed His command to the Prophet ﷺ, His law to the Prophet ﷺ, knowing that it is to be followed even today. So He knows our situation. He knows what we can do, what is in our favor, and what is not in our favor. And He is the most knowing, the most fair. So every single command that Allah has given is applicable. It can be practiced, and it should be practiced. There's no need to change it, to modify it, to reinterpret it. There's no need to do that. Assalamu alaikum. Every organization of or institution has a rules and regulations for the people that it serves. And not everybody understands or follows it. Or agrees with it. Or, or is pleased with it. Allah, like the world is like Allah is an institution. And He makes it and we, He serves us and we should follow every command just yes. like that. Yes, whether we like it or not, whether we find it easy or difficult, we have to. I'm just like addressing all the orders of Allah Ta'ala and directions, not only hijab. And um, in the very beginning after um, Suratul Fatiha, the first ayah after Alif Lamim is 
ساری کل کتاب الفی سو اللہ تعالیٰ جسٹ ان دا ویری بگننگ دیر از نو ڈاؤٹ اباؤٹ دا بک سو اینی تھنگ دیٹس ان دا بک ویدر وی فالوز اٹ ویدر اٹس اباؤٹ ربا اور ہجاب اور وی لائے اور ہاؤ ویدر وی ایکٹ دا آرڈرز آر رائٹ دین ویدر وی آر فالوئنگ اٹ اور ناٹ دیٹس ہاؤ اٹ از اینڈ دیٹس ہاؤ وی بلیو اٹس گوئنگ ٹو اسٹے ٹل دا ویری اینڈ And I just couldn't uh, help to reflect that in the very end, Surat Al-Falaq, or is it Surat Al-Nas? Surat Al-Nas is the last uh, surah. When it comes that shaitan put all those waswase in our mind, so all the doubts and all the things that we create, it's like shaitan whispers in our head and give us excuses. And, but when we reach there where we see it happening, because so many of our practices are so mixed up and we have messed them up a lot, so... things don't make sense because we have messed them up but allah's orders and things are all all straight yes and this is why the last surah qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas give yourself in allah's protection right against who people shaitan min al jinnati wan nas I think a big one was um, being honest to yourself because oftentimes we lie to ourselves about our faults and stuff and we don't acknowledge our like bad habits or sins. Like say we, if we have a bad akhlaq, we're like, oh no, no, my akhlaq's fine. And like people who are addicted to alcohol, it's often those people who are addicted who say, oh, you're drinking too much or whatever. Like they point out other people's mistakes, but they're addicted themselves. So similarly, we refuse to acknowledge our own mistakes because of that we can't obey Allah. And we find faults in the law of Allah. You know, there's a story about a, about a fox, right? I don't think fox eat grapes, but it's just a story. Okay, it's in Urdu, a famous story. that a fox was going and it found these grapes, all right? They were hanging from a grapevine. And it jumped and jumped and attempted many times to reach the grapes, but it couldn't. And eventually it said, oh, they're bitter anyway, all right? I mean, they're not sweet, they're not delicious, so it's not my fault. You know, I'm perfect, but the problem is with the grapes, right? So this is what sometimes we do as well. We don't want to acknowledge our shortcomings. We say, oh, it's too hard to do this. It's too hard to follow these laws. It's impossible to do it. A prized trait for people is that, you know, they're independent thinkers. They try to go for what is most beneficial for them, to go to wherever is most success for them, and to not follow the crowd. Like, that's a, conformity is something that people look down upon, even though everyone does it. But in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, it is not that person, it is the one who is obedient. The one who actually does what he is told to do. Most of the time, obedience or conformity, like I said, it's looked down as a bad thing. You know, so this person, the munafiq, who's going around looking for, you know what, oh, I don't have to go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I should go where it's beneficial for me. This is a trait that some people would call intelligent. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, no, this is dishonesty, this is unfairness. Because he is committed to one thing, but he is going against it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us traits that we should be regardless of what the world thinks is good and what is bad. Yes.